everyone. Uh, I'm Bill Carlson. Welcome to Cafe Contemp Online. Uh, I've got my colleague Del Acosta here to introduce our speaker. Good morning, everybody. Our program today is Poverty in Tampa and Hillsborough County, a very compelling subject. Our speaker is Terry Egan. He's project manager with the Hillsborough County City County Planning Commission. Terry, take it away. Good morning, Good morning. everybody. Um, I'm Terry Egan. I'm the uh, project manager slash research librarian at the uh, Hillsborough County City County Planning Commission. And today I'm gonna to, uh, give you an overview of some research we've been working on, on concentrations in poverty, a trend report uh, spanning the uh, decades from 1970 to the most recent uh, census uh, data release that came out in 2018. And before we begin, um, you're, you're going to be seeing a lot of uh, news articles coming out um, on the topic of poverty. Um, uh, primarily due to the impacts of COVID, um, though some came out beforehand. Uh, I put a link to a couple here. Uh, there's a great article from Christopher O'Donnell at the Tampa Bay Times, as well as a excellent article out of the New York Review of Books, uh, summarizing uh, the current research and literature on child poverty. And then finally, our own uh, story map and research at Plan Planning Commission on our concentrations of poverty, which has a series of interactive maps that you can go and uh, see the trends that I'm gonna show you um, in an interactive way. So before we begin get into this, um, I wanna concentrate on an overview of, of what is poverty, um, because prior to um, the 1960s, when there was a lot of discussion about poverty and we began tracking poverty, there was no way of actually measuring it in a meaningful way. So we looked at, they looked at poverty in a number of different ways. Um, it's essentially a what, you know, people are either in poverty or they aren't. But the difficult question is to why. Um, we're not going to get into that into a great detail in this presentation as to why. Um, we're focused more on the where the spatial components is shifting um, movement of concentrations of poverty throughout the area. But you can see some of the whys, whether people are um, uh, explain away poverty as individual factors, cultural factors, or uh, related factors of, of policy issues. And the big hurdle I have in presenting this uh, presentation is the question is, why does poverty even matter? How does it affect um, us? How does it affect me? You know, I'm not in poverty. Um, I don't live in an area that's have high concentrations of poverty. And, and there's two main um, factors. There's the, the moral ethic argument that you know, poverty is inherently bad and there are certain obligations we have to one another to mitigate poverty. Um, and there's also the economic and, and social cost. Um, there's been numerous stu studies that even small poverty spells for children can have great impacts for them um, later on in life and also affect um, the society. There are also negative consequences for areas of concentrated poverty, whether it's crime, blight, um, and there are costs to various social systems to help remedy um, the, these problems related to poverty. Yeah, and Terry, if I could just for a second. Um, sure. The, um, this is Bill. Um, if you ask uh, Moaz Limayam, who's the dean of the College of Business at USF, um, you know, this, the, these poverty numbers also hurt our chances of recruiting companies that want to invest. So, so mm -hmm. investors, uh, individual, high, um, high net worth individuals who want to invest, companies that want to invest, um, the best and brightest talent that look at our community, they pull up the real numbers of our community. And one of them that really holds us back is poverty. And so that, that's one of the reasons why we had this discussion this morning, because it's such a important topic. And by the way, while I have the floor, anybody who's watching live, please, we do this as a community service, please hit the share button so we can, uh, so you can share this information, important information with your friends. And if you have any questions, um, anytime post either to the bottom or to the right of the feed and we'll ask them as soon as he's done. Thanks, Terry, sorry to interrupt. Sure, no problem. So if we understand what poverty is, relatively speaking, um, and why it's important, then the question becomes, how do we measure poverty? Um, and like I said earlier, it wasn't until the mid 60s that the federal government came up with um, a mechanism 
and um, set of criteria and formula on how to identify um, how a household with the um, householder and the, the dependents um, are in poverty. And we measure poverty to highlight uh, economic disadvantages, um, set eligibility and benefit standards, and then also assess effects of, of programs and policies. And so when we measure poverty, we're, we're looking at one thing, but it can be explained in a number of different measurements. We're talking about poverty thresholds, but those also get teased out in what are called poverty guidelines. And there's also something called the ratio of income to poverty. And poverty thresholds are a kind of like a single dimensional um, measurement. It's essentially all before tax money income. And it's only updated annually for changes in the, the cost of goods. It's adjusted for family size. It was this very old measurement It's very controversial because it was created in the 1960s. It, gets ref, it doesn't get refined, it gets updated based on the um, changes in the cost of living. But being an older tool, um, it allows you to do uh, analysis over time, historical analysis. And the same values are assigned everywhere. And what does that mean? So this is what the poverty thresholds look like. This is for 2019, it's a big um, kind of ugly table. It's got 48 cells, and depending on where you are in, in here, um, if you're below that income, you're in poverty. And so I'm not sure how well this will show up on the screen, but four people um, with uh, two householders and two dependents, you're in poverty if your income is below $25,926. Like I said, this holds true whether you live in Washington, D.C., El Paso, Texas, Boulder, Colorado, who doesn't adjust for geographic areas, doesn't adjust for um, the varieties in the cost of living. And this is the revised um, poverty guidelines. So you hear them used interchangeably. Poverty guidelines are just a streamlined version of the poverty thresholds. Hey, Terry, let me ask this question. Um, when yes. we're talking about affordable housing or housing affordability, but they, that the affordable housing guidelines, they talk about a percentage of AMI. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Right. And what's the difference between that number and these poverty numbers? I believe the AMI is a derived value. It's, it's created by HUD and it's used for um, the actual metropolitan statistical area. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I'd have to look that up, though. Okay, thank you, sorry. Would you, would you explain to everybody what the AMI is? The area median income, it's um, a different value. Is that like a numeric threshold that if you fall below that number, I think it's 80% of the AMI, whatever that AMI might be, it might be $60,000. If you're below it, you're qualified for certain um, HUD benefits. I believe that's how it works out. Yeah, thank you. Sorry to take us off track there. Go ahead. No problem. So now you have, um, this is an alternate measurement of poverty. Some of you might actually be more familiar with this than the other ones. The ratio of income to poverty, whether someone's near poverty, it's a ratio of 100 to 125% of the poverty threshold. <clears throat> In poverty, you're at the threshold. Or deep poverty. So if the value for um, a family of four, uh, two parents, two children, um, deep poverty would be 50% of the value. So if your income was $13,000, um, you would be in deep poverty. And um, there, there was a book that came out about three, four years ago called um, um, Getting By on $2 a Day, where the um, authors did an in-depth analysis across the country, calling through a variety of um, income data. And they posit a new threshold, new category called extreme poverty, where you uh, are at 25% of the poverty threshold. So instead of getting by on $13,000 a day, you're getting by on uh, roughly $6,500 a day. And they found uh, there's about 1 million people uh, in the US who are getting by on $2 a day or less. So we're gonna trans transition over away from the, the, the definitions and the, the themes into looking at the actual poverty at the neighborhood level. Um, poverty at the neighborhood level, we're using census tracts, which are small geographic um, boundaries that have a set population threshold, which remains relatively constant over time. Um, and we're looking at tracts where 40% or more of the residents are in poverty. 
um, were using a special tool that came out of Brown University where they took census tracts, um, the boundaries as of 2010, and they um, retrofitted them back to the 1970 and all the subsequent censuses so that we'd have a constant geographic boundary to use uh, to track changes over time. And we're looking at the concentrations of poverty from the city centers and or downtown into the suburbs. And um, we're trying to test a th uh, thesis that's been very common right now in people who do the analysis of concentrations of poverty in that we're seeing a dispersion away of high concentrations of poverty from the downtown central city area into suburban development. And just to kind of show you where we're looking at, um, this is the trend that has occurred over time. You have the um, 1960 poverty rates and the decline after the um, a, a massive um, policy initiatives were passed in the late 60s as part of the war on poverty. And you can see where the trend is now for the US, Florida and Hillsborough County. And right now, and we certainly expect this to go up with everything that's been happening with COVID, we're looking at a poverty rate in Hillsborough County of 15.7%. So now we're gonna look at where those 15.7% um, reside. And this is the 1970 poverty um, concentrations by census tract. You only see one that's outside of the um, city area. So down here, there's an inset map of downtown Tampa, you have Harbor Island, you have portions of um, West Tampa, um, Ybor City, and then you have this outlier of, of Plant City. This is 1970. When we get to 1980, the map has changed. We're looking almost entirely in downtown. You still have West Tampa, you still have um, downtown um, where uh, county center is, um, and then the uh, moving outwards into portions of Ewer City. So this is 1980, 1990, um, not much has changed. It's still fairly concentrated in the downtown area. And then we hit the lowest concentration of poverty in the year 2000 where we had a big um, uh, whoops, boom in the economy and the, a lot of the tracks have dropped out. We're not seeing as much concentrations in poverty. And then getting into 2010, we see that trend that was being discussed. And part of this can be explained when we were in or coming out of the Great Recession. So, um, you see downtown, it's expanding east. You have um, the university area popped up for the first time. And so you see that area over here. Terry, let me, let me interrupt for a second. So it's, am I correct that this is a migration of poor people out of the neighborhoods where they were living to new areas or is it just that the people that were living in the, in the areas um, like in the USF area, um, suddenly became poor? It would be a combination of both. I mean, we, we'd have to deal, uh, drill down into some of their income um, data and do a bit more in-depth analysis. But um, clearly, you know, this, this pattern tracks the business cycle. So when you have a recession, you're gonna have more people in poverty, you're gonna have more tracks light up. But also um, you're seeing a shift based on policy decisions that started in the 90s of um, decentralizing um, concentrations of poverty that were in the, traditionally in a downtown area. And I don't wanna say push, but um, people were being shifted away and out. Like I can't really explain what's having, happening in um, this Palm River area here. Um, that seems anomalous but that's, that's where we are. We have a higher concentration of poverty and that will stay the same even when we get out of the recession, when we get into the data from 2014 to 2018, which is here, you see a lot of the um, um, high concentrations have started to tamp down, but you still see, at least in the downtown area, a shift away. It's moved slightly further east out of the concentrations that was um, solidly there. And then you have the remaining um, high uh, concentrations of poverty 
tracks up in the university area. And probably you're gonna see the same map uh, appear that we had for 2010 to 2014 for the next um, census data that comes out reflecting what's going on in COVID right now. So that's, that's the shift, that's the trend in the concentrations of poverty. And then I put a little slide in because when I asked this before, people said, well, what do we do about it? And I didn't have an answer. So I looked through some of the literature and there's been um, different proposals floated um, from a wide variety of sources. Um, you can look at them. Um, <clears throat> probably the one that is the easiest to implement would be the participation in the earned income tax credit, which has been a pretty popular tool for people with um, low in, low income working families to earn, you know, between $3,000, $5,000 every year as part of their um, tax filings. But there's other, other um, tools available. And um, it's been 15 minutes, so I think that covers everything I was going to cover in this presentation. I'm ready to field some questions. Yeah, thank you. We've got a we've got a couple of questions from the floor. If you and if you want to take that presentation off, um, okay. Um, it, one Can you question, stop sharing. Yeah, and one question is from PJ Somerville, who's the president of Capital on Tampa. She said, "Do the ratios of income to poverty apply across the country?" And then also, uh, Rusty Carpenter asked the question about. Um, the impact of COVID-19 on the numbers in the future? Well, um, yeah, the ratio of um, income to poverty, if that, if that was a question, that's going to be the same across the country. It's all just a, a ratio based on um, your income. Related with respect to um, the forthcoming census data, the census collects data monthly. Um, collecting income data. And of course, part of that would be the poverty data. So we're gonna see um, this data come out. Now there's a, a cycle of where they publish the data. So the data comes out in at the census tract level in four year, I mean, in five year uh, chunks, it's a survey set. So the next set that's gonna come out will be next year in 2019, that'll have a little bit. Um, and then 20, as we get into 2020, it'll probably have a little bit more. Um, the other thing is the census has been implementing these pulse surveys where they're tracking in real time, they're texting people, they're emailing people that are on their list to participate in surveys to get a feel for how they are um, doing for income. I mean, how they're doing work-wise. I'm not sure if it translates down to income, but that may be something you see come out later on um, if we start seeing peaks in, in income or poverty issues, the census may add that to their uh, poll survey to track sure, as well. We've got a couple more questions from the floor. Um, one of them is, uh, does the, d in the in the count of, of poverty, does it include homeless? Is there a way to track homeless numbers in that? Um, you know, I don't know how they track the homeless in with that question, because most of their census data is based on household um, survey responses. So someone lacking a, a household would probably not be included in it. Another question is, if you had to pick one policy to focus on, what change do you think would be the most impactful on poverty locally? Um, if I had to pick one, I'd probably go with the $3,000 um, child tax credit. I allocate $3,000 each year per child. That'd be a federal policy that has to be implemented. Can I ask you a question? So we're, you know, we're all trying to figure out how to address this issue uh, going forward. And so if we just look at the last 10 years, um, and there are all kinds of things happen, we had the Great Recession, and now we have COVID-19. Um, <clears throat> but if you just look at the last 10 years, could you tell us what the, again, what the trends are that you saw? We saw the maps about how uh, people move from what you called the downtown area to, um, to other areas. <clears throat> but mm -hmm. what are the spatial changes? What are the number changes? Did, and it, so we also, before COVID-19, we had one of the greatest economic booms in in America's history. Um, did our poverty rate in Tampa and Hillsboro, did it go up or down or stay the same? And, and where did poverty shift? So if the poverty rate has been essentially the same for, you know, since the 80s, I mean, if you look at the data, it, it, it modulates, 
you know, a tick, a point or two based on a uh, business cycle, but it's going to be around 16%, 15%, could go up to highs 18, 19%. Um, but what we're seeing is a high concentration of that is going to be um, children. And through a series of um, changes in where the poor have been living over time, um, you're seeing a shift away from um, concentrations in a, in a kind of center, center city model and moving them out to um, lower income where the rent may be a little bit cheaper um, to the university area and then easterly down in the Palm River area. Terry, how does our poverty rate compare with other cities and counties in the Tampa Bay region? And then if you have time, how does it compare to the national averages? Um, I have not compared it to other municipalities or the area. I was more in I've been focused more on how does poverty, um, does, does, is Hillsborough County unique or is Hillsborough County following the national trends in poverty dispersion? Um, I thought we would not be following it because we have a kind of a, a different development pattern, you know, being a Sunbelt city. Um, but no, we did follow it. We followed exactly how they predicted we would follow it. We're slowly migrating out into suburban areas or quasi-suburban areas from a central city. Um, the poverty rate, I believe, we're less in the state of Florida, but higher than the U national average. Del, do you have any other questions? Well, I was going to follow up. Um, you, you state that um, with childhood poverty, is there any tracking of children continuing to stay in poverty as they become adults? Or uh, is what is the shift that takes somebody out of poverty? Someone that has been raised in poverty, how do they get out of poverty? Well, from a, just a numerical sense, you know, if they're in a household that moves um, from that income where you're below that threshold to above that threshold. But um, the, the key thing to understand about poverty is that um, we don't really talk about it as much in this presentation, but episodic poverty, where you have a spell or two where you're um, hard to make ends meet, can't afford the rent. Um, it doesn't last, but events like that can be very threatening to a household. So the Fed um, publishes a annual report on um, issues with income as it relates to households. You know, one of the factors, and you hear people talk about this a lot, is that 40% of households right now um, could not be able to, would not be able to absorb a $500 hit to their income. Um, they would have to either, you know, borrow money from family, put it on a credit card, um, do other things. But in that number, 12% of those households would not be able to absorb that hit at all. They have no other mechanism. They can't go to a, a title loan place. They have no credit cards. They have no recourse to family or friends. That's the issue that we're dealing with when we talk about episodic poverty in that they may not be able to handle it. It may take them a while to get out of it. It won't be a 10 year spell, but it'd be long enough that it can have lasting repercussions to the children in that household. Terry, there's a couple questions from the floor. Um, uh, two of them are about minimum wage. Um, and, and just so everybody knows, T Catholic on Tampa is nonpartisan. Um, we, we ask all questions, so we, we want to be fair to everybody's point of view. And if you haven't already, please hit the share button so everybody can see this information. Uh, what we're trying to do is raise awareness about the numbers, which is the poverty rate. Um, and Terry, we're putting you on the, on the spot for some questions that might be a little bit political. So um, okay. you work in the research department at, at the Planning Commission. So if you feel uncomfortable for whatever reason, just tell us that. Uh, we, we brought you here to, to look at the data, analyze the data. But here's a question. Would raising the minimum wage drastically change poverty levels? For instance, poverty is defined as 26200 for a family of four, which would equate to a minimum wage of $12.50 per hour if one adult was working in the household. And so if another question by someone else said, you know, would a $15 an hour um, wage change, change that, change the poverty rate? Um, you know, from a numerical standpoint, 
and being nonpartisan, um, I would say, you know, it probably would um, just from a numerical standpoint, um, you know, the other people that argue against that for the overhead of, of how it would affect businesses. I'm not a labor economist expert, so you really want to field those questions by someone like that. But just from a strictly numerical perspective, then, you know, probably. Let me ask you another question. So one of the things we hear a lot uh, about poverty is the number of kids in our school district on free and reduced lunch. And it's a very, very high number. I forgot what it is um, uh, exactly. Maybe you remember, but how how did those two numbers come together? So if our poverty rate is around 15 or 16 percent, and I think the free and reduced lunch rate is above 50 percent, how, how, do, how do you marry those two? I'm not sure. I believe it has to do with one of those ratios where if, if you if your household is within 200 percent of the poverty rate you qualify so if you think about what 200 percent of the poverty rate would be that'd be a fairly high number that would put you up around you know uh, fifty thousand dollars or something like that so that would put you and make you qualify for a free and reduced lunch jerry let me ask you another question um in your statistics you didn't mention farm laborers and migrants is uh, the, when you evaluate uh, poverty, does that include uh, the temporary seasonal workers that live here or the migrant farmers who some of them ha happen to live longer periods of time? That's an excellent question. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know how um, um, uh, what they consider non-ag workers as well, what we're looking at in the, these reported data, I believe, but I would have to double check the sources to verify that as to what's being captured and who's being asked. Do you know also, Terry, um, uh, how how much of our poverty rate is is affected by in migration? Sometimes people assume in Florida that if someone's moving from another state, that they're rich and they're going to buy a, a big mansion somewhere. But there are people who are below the poverty line that are moving to Florida and in, into the Tampa area. Do we have any idea um, uh, how, how our poverty rate is affected by that? No, no, I don't know how that would be. Um tracked, but I do know, having done some research on in-migration and out-migration, um, that it's almost a wash. Um, it, between state migration is not nearly as consequential for Hillsborough County like it was, say, in the 70s. It's been diminished, and most of the in-migration that you see is from other counties moving in, and those numbers are almost equal by the number of people moving out of Hillsborough County into those um, corresponding counties. So I, I don't think it would be a big, big impact. One of the one of the things people have kind of been saying, I followed some of the messaging here, um, you know, talking about spatial poverty, um, you know, there have been some policies uh, by the city and county to um, to do redevelopment, um, in some cases gentrification. Um, is there is there a way to correlate um, the cost of housing with the the pattern of migration? So if if the if the, you know on the on the west bank of the river there was a high number of affordable homes that were torn down, and so then suddenly there's a bunch of people up in the in the USF area. Is there is there a way to correlate or track um, you know where there's available affordable housing versus uh, you know where the the levels of poverty are? It's difficult because some of that data is simply not available. Um, one of the things that we're, you contend with when you do um, poverty research is that someone who's got one or two bad um, hits on their credit may not be able to um, find affordable housing in a, in a traditional um, apartment or house. And they may be working in these other areas that um, charge them much higher rates but overlook their poor credit history. Um, so in that being the case, it's difficult to find any type of market research that will capture what those um, asking rents are in these areas. Dell, did you have any final question? Well, I have a kind of a comprehensive question and Terry, just let me know if this is something that you're not uh, prepared to answer. You've prepared a lot of excellent statistical information about what, where the problem is and to a degree where it exists uh, uh, geographically. How do you see your study uh, being used by policymakers to better the lives of the people in Tampa Hillsborough County? Well, I would like um, policymakers to, to be able to take this up and um, run with this research and, and kind of look. It, it's almost like this research is the first step. I see this as being more of a 
comprehensive atlas of building layer upon layer of other demographic data or socioeconomic data. You know, we know where high concentrations of poverty are and we know we're moving. Now, what are we gonna do about it? What other pieces of the puzzle do we need to find out um, going in there? You know, is it, a, is it a racial ethnicity breakdown? Is that the next step? Is it um, areas that have high children? Are there areas that have high um, senior citizens? What other parts of the picture do we need to flesh out of this to move forward and come up with some type of targeted policy actions? Have you started to take your, your presentation on the road as you know, using that so that policymakers are seeing it and uh, internalizing it? Um, a little bit. Um, poverty is not the most pleasant of topics to present to people. So they're not always willing to hear you know, bad news. Um, so um, as, as long as the, we maintain the offer, we publish this both as a PDF on our website and as a, a, a story map, which is basically all the maps are live and interactive, as well as additional data, video, um, explaining some of these topics. So it, it's available. Terry, on that note, um, we're out of time. Could okay. you want to plug um, any websites that people can go to for more information? Um, yeah, let me... Give me one second. And while you're doing that, I just want to say thank you, and especially thank you for taking the tough questions. Um, you know, we we at Capping on Tampa uh, want to have um, uh, you know difficult conversations, comprehensive conversations about the about the community, and you know the information you're presenting is is critically important. And you know, a lot of there are lots of community leaders from you know diverse backgrounds that participate with Catholic on Tampa, and uh, the better we arm them with data, uh, you know, the better they're able to uh, make their decisions. Yeah, you know, I'm having trouble finding it right now, but I'll tell you what, um, it is in the slide. So if someone's watching this live, they can. Um, oh, I found it. Give me one second. Let me share the screen. If you go to Plan Hillsborough and search for concentrations of poverty on our website, it's planhillsborough.com. Um, there is a interactive story map with everything I presented to you, plus videos. And there are the maps themselves that you can go in here and interact with, as well as additional data like for uh, eviction data, um, redlining data, in information about gentrification. So all that's available. It has an ugly URL at the top. So your best bet is to just uh, Google uh, concentrations of poverty on our website. But that would um, that would great. Be well, thank, thank you very much for uh, participating with us on a Friday morning. I think this is your second time with us, and yep. we hope to be back again soon. Uh, thank you to my colleague Della Costa for his help, uh, and to PJ, our president, and uh, Barbara Deacon and uh, Sandy Reef, our uh, other board members, and. Um, uh, thanks everybody for watching. If you haven't already hit the share button and one final thanks. Um, I'm actually, I use a virtual background, but I'm in my brother's office in beautiful downtown Sebring today using his free Wi-Fi. So thank you to Jeff for doing that as well. Thanks everybody. Uh, see you next week.